Well, welcome everyone to Spirit of Truth Church for this introduction to the Gospel of Matthew. So let's go ahead and begin our journey into Matthew with what an introduction actually is. So when I say introduction, I mean background information. In other words, general theme, authorship, sources. Uh, we're talking about time and date and place. We're talking about overall structure. So that's the kind of stuff that we mean when we say an introduction to a book of literature specifically, and in this case, the Gospel of Matthew. So what is the Gospel of Matthew, just in general? Well, it is absolutely the most Jewish of all of the Gospels. Jesus being presented as the King of the Jews is one of the central themes of this Gospel, and it's the portrayal of Jesus that Matthew puts at the forefront. Now we have to remember, Matthew was a tax collector turned into a disciple. And so as he's writing this book <clears throat> to the believer, his gospel is pointing to the legitimacy of Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, one of the main reasons why he essentially came over to Christ in the first place. And second, to the unbelieving Jew, it portrays the one who is the savior of all people everywhere. Uh, again, and this is the case because remember, there was a common belief that salvation is for the Jew. And so now you're seeing this, this outpouring, well, no, 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 it's for all believers, whether Jew or Gentile. Something else we're going to talk a little bit about in our time today is the primacy of Matthew in the early church and in general. And I'm going to argue <clears throat> that our gospel traditions began actually with Matthew and not Mark. Although there, there, there is some evidence for Mark, but I actually do think uh, that Matthew, at least in some sense, had written the first writings about Christ uh, in terms of a gospel, and we'll get to that later. He's going to bridge both the Old and the New Testaments. His heavy emphasis on Messianic prophecy is going to do this. He's going to make the transition from the law to the grace in terms of dispensations. Matthew's also going to focus on the Jewish leader's rejection of Christ. And again, it's going to emphasize his portrayal as the rightful king of Israel and the king of kings overall. So with that, let's jump right in. The background of Matthew. Again, this is going to serve, the Gospel of Matthew is going to serve as an introduction to the New Testament. Okay, it presents Jesus as the prophesied Messiah of the Old Testament. Now, there are 130 references to the Hebrew scriptures in the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus is constantly being shown to be the one who fulfills these prophecies and types of the Old Testament. Because remember, there are direct Messianic prophecies and there are also types. How Jesus sort of mimics the, the, the history of Israel even in his own life. <clears throat> and we'll see all of that in our study of Matthew. Now again, as I mentioned earlier, Matthew's a customs officer or tax collector in the territory of Herod Antipas. This meant that he was educated, he could read, he could write, he was probably trilingual, Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So Matthew is no dumb guy. He's very intelligent, he knows most likely three languages, and again, being a tax collector, he was also advanced in mathematics and general business principles. Now originally, Matthew was known as Levi which would probably indicate that he was part of the priestly tribe of Levites. His name was changed, however, after a dramatic encounter with Jesus to Matthew. And part of the reason I think for that, and I think others would agree, is Matthew's name closely resembles the word in Greek for disciple. Okay, And so you're going to see this kind of play like Matthew's main emphasis really is discipleship. Now it's important to note that a publican or tax collector, uh, he was wealthy or at least well off. We don't know how much he had, but, but he, was, he was not hurting for money. And he was considered the worst of the sinners by his Jewish brethren for the type of job that he did and for making money essentially off of people um, you know, in, in the form of taxes. But again, this is going to show us Matthew's transformation as a disciple from this sinner tax collector person to one of the most important disciples we have in terms of the fact that he was really building a bridge between uh, the Old and New Testaments, and building a bridge from Christ to the Jewish people. <clears throat> and from the opening of his gospel, he presents Jesus as the promised Messiah and Emmanuel, who is God with us. 
So again, let's dive into this idea of his portrait of a king, or this portrait as a king. So the Gospels present four views or accounts of Jesus' life through specific theological lenses with specific concerns in mind. These accounts are produced between 40 and 90 AD, some would say 50 and 90, basically you know, somewhere 40s, 50s, all the way up through to the, the early 90s, probably 90 AD for John. And they were produced from eyewitness testimony and verbal accounts. You know, we have things in Luke saying how he investigated all of these things. Um, again, we have people like Mark, who most likely got their comments from Peter. Matthew, again, was just simply an eyewitness of the events. Not every single event, but of many of the events. And they also went and collected the stories uh, about Jesus from various people as well. So essentially, we have these gospel accounts being, being written from that perspective. <clears throat> and their basic purpose is to present the gospel message which is the good news of the Redeemer Savior. Now, on this point, I would like to say, there are many who are trying to change the gospel message. The gospel message is the good news of the Redeemer Savior, that he has come, he is saved from your sins, and he will come again. In this purpose, you have Jesus being presented as the Messiah of Israel, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. And the gospels were written so that the readers would come to believe in Christ and receive eternal life. So we can't get it mixed around. The Gospels were written for evangelistic purposes. They were written to give people the word of God that they might respond and come to believe in Christ and receive eternal life. That is the point. Second, they present Jesus as the living Lord of glory in heaven. Okay, so again, Jesus is alive. He's not dead. He's alive. In terms of a general audience and purpose, here's a basic breakdown of the four Gospels. With Matthew, you essentially have the Hebrew people in mind, the Jewish people in mind. And so his main presentation is going to be as Christ, as the king of the Jews. With Mark, he has Rome in mind. <clears throat> and he is presenting Christ as the servant of the Lord. In Luke, you have a sort of a Greek mentality in mind. And he is going to present Jesus as Christ, the son of man, a very lofty uh, divine title. And finally, John... Oh, and, and by the way, Matthew and Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke form the Synoptic Gospels. They share a lot of similar stories and even similar language. John is kind of a complete departure. And this is really an interpretation of the life of Christ in terms of deity. And so it's presenting Christ as the Son of God. <clears throat> now, Matthew again presents Jesus as the King of the Jews. And on each bookend are Gentiles who acknowledge this truth. You've got the Magi at the beginning. And you've got Pilate at the end. And they're both affirming that Jesus is king. Okay, remember the Magi come, he's the king. Pilate, hey, it's as I have said, king of the Jews. So again, this statement is against the Jews in rejection. Um, because even Gentiles are recognizing who Jesus is, that he is indeed the king of the Jews. And so Matthew's gospel also acts as an apologetic for Jesus as Messiah and king. And it does so in two main ways. Uh, first, through the genealogical right of Jesus to the throne, which is what we're going to start our sermon series with, is the genealogy. <clears throat> and second, through the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. So you're getting both of these working together to demonstrate Jesus as Messiah and King. So now let's jump into this idea of another theme of Matthew, the promise of the kingdom. So the one question that might naturally come is, why does David's name appear before Abraham's in the genealogy? And the reason is because Matthew is presenting Jesus as king. He's the rightful heir to the Davidic throne and the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Okay? He develops this thesis along three main points. First, he demonstrates uh, a presentation of the king. In other words, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then he gets into the rejection of the king. <clears throat> the Jewish people, leadership specifically, do not accept him. And finally, the postponement of the kingdom. Now, this is very important. There are two main schools of thought on how to read Matthew. There is the covenantalist getting into sort of liberal understanding. Not, it's not liberal, but it can get that way. And there's a dispensational. Dispensational says the king was presented, rejected, and the kingdom thus is postponed. The covenantal view says the kingdom is presented, rejected by the Jews, but it still comes. It's not postponed. It still comes, at least in part. Some people argue that it's fully come. Other people argue that it's come in part. Um, but I'm going to be arguing that actually, no, the Bible is very clear. The kingdom was postponed and will be given to a later generation. So what is Matthew's doctrine of the kingdom? Well, it's these sort of eight principles. <clears throat> First, that the kingdom would be ruled by the son of David. You can't have the kingdom without the king. It's the son of David, Jesus. 
Second, that the king of the Jews would be the Christ of Psalm 2. Okay, we're going to see how that plays out. Third, that the herald of the kingdom of heaven would be John the Baptist. Fourth, that the kingdom of heaven was at hand because the king, the son of God, was present. So in other words, the kingdom of heaven being at hand is not a reference to the kingdom is, is, going, to, is going to be enacted immediately. It is simply a statement reflective of the fact that the king is now in the land, that the king has come. So the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, next, we have the kingdom of heaven would raise a series or would have a series of rules and laws administered by the king. In other words, it's got a rulership to it. Next, uh, Christ spoke of the kingdom in mysteries, in spiritual parables, because of the hardness of the hearts of the people of Israel. Seventh, the kingdom of heaven would be removed from the present generation and given to a future generation. Okay, that's key. We don't have the kingdom now. It is not here. Eight, not the kingdom that he was talking about anyway. Eight, the kingdom of heaven will someday be established on earth by the king, the son of man. So that's essentially Matthew's doctrine of the kingdom. Those are the main points that we're going to be seeing come out during our series. Now, this does not mean, however, because it was delayed or the kingdom was, was postponed, that the promises to Israel are canceled or that the covenants are canceled. Uh, again, there's some, some are simply postponed. In fact, some blessings we received immediately through Jesus, the, the blessings to the nations, all people will be blessed, that was partially fulfilled, at least through Jesus' coming, and then salvation going to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Uh, but other promises, like, for example, the Davidic throne forever and ever, uh, the, remain, the, uh, the, the restoration of Israel as a nation, both spiritually and, and physically, those things would be far off. <clears throat> so the gospel, again, is then designed to explain to Jewish people why Christ suffered and died, and why there was the resulting postponement of his triumph until his second coming. So that's essentially the kingdom understanding throughout the Gospel of Matthew. <clears throat> so let's now move into the primacy of Matthew. <clears throat> so in early church history, Matthew held a primary place among the Gospels. It's always first. Every single time, in every single list, it's always going to be first in terms of the order of the Gospels. Um, it's Old Testament Messianic prophecy is a great bridge from old to new. Every manuscript uh, as well that contains the opening of Matthew, attributes the gospel to Matthew. So there's a general understanding in the early church. This gospel is attributed to Matthew. We have no reason to doubt that Matthew, the disciple, uh, wrote this gospel. He did. There's no question about it. Early church fathers are unanimous in the attribution uh, to Matthew as well. And early church traditions also credit Matthew with writing the first gospel. Now there's some questions about what that means. Did Matthew write a set of sayings in Aramaic, for example, that he then wrote not translated, but just wrote a Greek account as well. Did he write a full gospel in Aramaic and then also rewrote it, so to speak, in Greek? Um, what happened there? We just don't know. There, there's no way to tell. But we do know that Matthew was writing early, Matthew was writing first, and they give primacy to Matthew. <clears throat> Second, conservative scholars typically reject the idea that Matthew used Mark as a source and instead hold that it's an original apostolic witness. Now, this is where it gets kind of difficult because there are some substantial similarities. Here are some ways to account for these. It could very well be that these stories were, were held by people like the Apostle Matthew or people like Peter, etc., and that they essentially kind of told the stories in their own, in their own way with very similar wording. It's possible. Okay? It's possible. And so then they got written down. Again, Mark wrote down Peter's and Matthew wrote down his own accounts. There's a number of different possible reasons. Uh, for why they would differ, why they're the same. And we will get into some of that during our our time here on certain stories I'm going to pick out and show the actual differences between the gospel accounts and why. Uh, but again, uh, there's a lot of conservative scholars that actually hold Matthew first. <clears throat> and again, there's a substantial amount of interdependence, but again, there are explanations. So what about the personality of the author? Well, there's a lot of support actually for Matthew being the author besides just external attribution. First, the other Gospels only refer to him as Levi. It's only Matthew that you get him as the disciple Matthew. He has a familiarity with money and coins. For example, Mark and Luke use the word denarian, but Matthew used the more technical term nomisma, which also, oddly enough, uh, as, as a fun little aside story, um, nomismatology is the study of coins. He also used six other monetary terms that are not used anywhere else in the Gospels and used three monetary terms that are used elsewhere. He also records two parables involving money, a parable of talents, things like that, and he uses numbers and lists with a clerical-like precision. In other words, he's, he's very technical when he gets into those. And then there's even the Matthew 9, 10, and Mark 2, 15 connection, which is where essentially after Matthew's calling, they go and have a meal, and the, ex the explanation is that it's at the author's house. It's at his own house. 
So it seems like that was sort of a telling thing that, yeah, this is actually Matthew who's writing this. And you find that when, uh, in comparison to Mark 2.15. So what's the place and date of writing? Well, uh, early dating places it in the early 50s AD. Uh, this is, again, due to a lack of a fallen temple. There, there's a few indications in the text that the temple's still around, that people, the Jews are still doing things, and there's still rituals being described in there. And so essentially the understanding is that it was written pre the temple's fall. Um, also, there's statements like, and it's said, and, and this is done to this day. And the problem is, if it's post-70, Jerusalem's fallen, the exiles happen. I mean, it's all been wiped out. I mean, the whole ruling order's been wiped out. So the statements like, it's done to this day, don't really make sense. Like, the Jewish leadership are passing around the lie that the disciples stole the body to this day or something like that. They wouldn't because, it, 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 you know, Jerusalem's kind of been wiped out at that point. So <clears throat> through the through the uh, through the siege and then the destruction of the temple, I mean not completely wiped out, but you know it, it would make more sense to place those pre seventy AD. Uh, additionally, it was also most likely written in Jerusalem. Antioch is the other place posed, but again, if you're holding to an early dating, Jerusalem makes sense. So what is the plan of the gospel? <clears throat> Last thing we'll talk about here: what is the plan of the gospel? Well, again, I said it's written with evangelism in mind. Okay, it's going to set out to prove that Jesus is the promised Messiah and the King of the Jews. It's going to portray him as the teacher of righteousness, who properly explains the law of Moses, again, and has authority in that way, and its application in everyday life. He's going to speak with this divine authority, as in a certain amount. You know, it was said to you, but I say. Uh, again, that's a, that's a strong authority, and we're going to talk more about that when we get there. And states that the acts of righteousness must come from the heart, not these external things. Uh, he's going to upstage every major Jewish sect, even in a single day, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians. He's going to condemn false teachers. He's going to predict the destruction of the temple. And the emphasis really in Matthew's gospel is on these discourses and the narrative elements between this discourse and narrative kind of structure. And the main discourses are Sermon on the Mount, the Charge to the Twelve, the Parables of the Kingdom, the Teaching on True Greatness, the Denunciation of the Pharisees, and the Olivet Discourse. Additionally, uh, you can tell the Jewishness of the gospel because rather than Kingdom of God, um, it says Kingdom of Heaven or Heavens, plural, is actually how it's written. And the reason for that, again, is, is to replace the word God with something else, but for the reverence of the name of God. It's a more Jewish reference. Uh, but again, it's interchangeable with kingdom of God. Um, what about evangelism? <clears throat> again, I said that the gospel is evangelistic. Well, here are the lessons that Matthew typically teaches on evangelism. First, that repentance is a changing of the mind. It has to do with the rejection of sin and the acceptance of Christ the Savior. That salvation does not come through one's pedigree or origin of birth, but through faith. That water baptism is an outward sign of repentance that does not cause one to be saved. That true salvation will be the baptismal work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> uh, that the results of salvation will be that one will follow Christ. And that the heart of salvation is to believe that Christ is the Son of the living God. And so these are the core things that, that Matthew teaches about salvation. There's also frequent reference to Gentiles, both in terms of salvation and ministry. And again, Matthew's going to utilize the word disciple a number of times as well, uh, hinting again at the fact that this is about discipleship. And as many would argue, and I would as well, this really is a literary masterpiece. This is well thought out, well structured, well organized. It, it's, it's, got, it's rich. There's tons of different things to pull out of it. And as a result, I'm very excited to be getting to a sermon series on the Gospel of Matthew. And with this, I hope you all have a wonderful uh, rest of your day. And thank you so much for joining us here at Spirit of Truth Church. Have a wonderful day.